today's video is more about a life update as well as some perfume related things but I feel like I owed you more of an explanation as to why I've been away. I've touched upon it a little bit on Instagram, um, so if you don't follow me over there, make sure you do because that's when I give you the most real-time updates. Okay, so first I was invited to Paris by Gibaudan to celebrate 85 years of perfumery. And if you don't know who Gibaudan is, they're a fragrance manufacturer, house of creation, and they make fragrances for a lot of the brands, like designers, niche, I mean, they have some of the best perfumers in the world. Not only that, but they also do flavors and aromas for food industry and beverages. So they do a lot of things and they've created some of the most iconic fragrances. We were taken through three different rooms to discover this 85 years of perfumery. Now the first room is all about fragrance icons, kind of go through like the history of fragrance. What was super cool was that the team at Gibaudan recreated formulas of iconic fragrances and they managed to transcribe them in today's world because a lot of the formulas they had maybe different names of ingredients or they have ingredients that they you know you can't find anymore but still after a lot of time and trial and error they managed to recreate scents like fragrance by Scaffiarelli, Fraca, Magriffe and also L'Air du Temps by Nina Ricci. All these iconic scents were there and we could smell them. What was very very cool to discover was also a, a really old perfume formula that's dating back to 1913 um, from the archives and look at this you have um, the uh, different ingredients here the amount of grams and I don't know I think this is such a cool touch and they also gave us the fragrance that has been recreated with that original formula in here and it's essentially a cologne like type of scent you have notes of um, bergamot, lemon, lavender, orange flower, etc. So very, very cool um, to have a fragrance that was created in 1913. And then we moved into room number two, which was more about modern perfumery and niche. What the team did was that they asked their perfumers, what are the most iconic, most memorable fragrances that they created? And so I think there was like over a hundred fragrances that they came up with but they narrowed it down to 14 fragrances that really were an artistic expression, that was something special and really iconic when it comes to um, modern artistic perfumery. There were so many of my favorite fragrances in there. One of them was Ingredients by Maison Crivelli, which by the way, I could smell from across the room. I was sitting, standing next to a guy and I thought that he was wearing ingredients. I was like, oh, this guy smells so good. But actually, from across the room, I could see ingredients that was displayed and I was like, oh wow, like, it really, really is strong and projects a lot. It was really great to discover them this way and with each fragrance, there was a little note uh, that the perfumer shared along with their creation and that just added an additional special touch. And then we moved into the third and final room and this is about the future of perfumery. The lovely Ashley in Paris, if you have watched her YouTube channel, you would know who she is. She is a young perfumer at Givaudan and if you haven't checked out her YouTube channel you totally should because she's so incredibly knowledgeable and a really nice girl. Um, so she was there uh, presenting the future of perfumery and they had a machine called Carto and I read about this. It's essentially AI that you can use as a tool to discover new fragrance combinations and I had never seen it live and so it was so cool to see how this tool was being used and this is what the future generations of perfumers are using today as a support system to create new fragrances. So it looked very futuristic. Ashley was playing around with it. It looks super cool. It looked like out of a movie or something. You can select different families and then select specific ingredients and Carto will then come up with different combinations that would work. And essentially it just expands that olfactive palette and just enables for even more creativity and the result is instant and you can see it's hooked up to a machine 
and that machine will precisely measure the different essences together and then you have your trial that's there. And I think that's really innovative in fragrance development. We also had the chance to smell fragrances from some students in the perfumery school and they were really, really amazing. Truly, I was mind blown and they used Gartou to help develop their creations. So I thought that was fascinating um, and really enjoyed uh, that part of the session too. And to conclude the tour, we finished with La Pièce de Résistance, which was a tour of the laboratories. Never in my life did I think that I would have the opportunity to go down to the Givaudan Perfume Laboratory where all of the magic happens. I mean, this is, it's, it's, it's just a wow moment in your life, you know? So the way that um, fragrances are developed and the way that the perfumers work, so they'll get a brief which from a client which actually goes from the commercial and marketing teams. They will basically have a meeting, commercial team, marketing team, fragrance evaluator and perfumer. They'll all sit together um, and then the perfumer will get the brief, start creating and they're not actually the ones that are individually, you know, dropping uh, the, the essences. That is the job of the perfumer's assistant. And it's a very tedious process and very precise as well. So when we went to the labs, part of the process is done by a machine. So it's automated, but there's some ingredients that need to be weighed in a specific way like powders or resins and need to be dissolved and prepared in a way that the machine cannot do. So that is where the perfumer assistants come in. What was super interesting was that they never know what the for full formula is. It's such a secretive industry. Of course, I mean, you know, you don't want anyone to get their hands on the full formula. Only the perfumer has access to the full formula. But other than that, no one else does. Perfumer assistants will weigh very precisely all the different oils and essences and then will give the final mixture to the perfumer for the perfumer to smell and you know, comment on and if there's further modifications, then they'll go back to the lab and create more trials. I can tell you that it smells great in the lab. There's lots of interesting smells around and we had the amazing opportunity to meet the assistant perfumer of Contarviche, who is Raisa, and she was so lovely um, and she had like so many different perfume trials, like little samples everywhere that she was working on. I can only imagine how many projects um, they're working on at the same time, but it was really cool to meet her and um, and yeah, that was a very special moment. And that concluded the tour. It was such an incredible experience. It's always fascinating to get a little glimpse into the behind the scenes of an industry that frankly is quite secretive and obscure. You never really know how things are created um, and like, you know, who's behind all these creations. That was very, very special. And I hope that you enjoyed a little glimpse of it too. You would have noticed that I've been away here and there. The reason why I was away was because I needed to take some time off to focus on my health. Now, it's not anything drastic or bad, um, but I've been struggling these last few months from a mental health perspective, which is why I took a month off initially from content creation, got back into it and still wasn't feeling great. So I took some more time off. What I noticed when I wasn't feeling great and when I'm stressed is that I go into really bad eating habits and it's something that I struggled with for a while. On my channel, I briefly touched upon, um, you know, a, a sugar addiction and this is something that I have struggled with for as long as I can remember. And it's not about, you know, eating a few sweets here and there or like having, you know, a lot of carbs. Like I'm not talking about carbs. I'm talking about sweet treats like cookies, like candy, chocolate, etc. like pastries, all this good stuff. I've come to the realization that I have a problem with that. And I kind of wanted to open up with you a little bit. Um, and, you know, maybe some of you struggle with this as well. And, you know, this is just to say that you're not alone. Um, I'm going on a health journey at the moment. And so, you know, if we can help each other, I think that's 
that's a, a, a great thing to have that support system. So I just wanted to throw it out there. This is something that is very personal and very vulnerable. I don't know why I'm getting upset at this. This is ridiculous. But essentially, um, these last few weeks, I've, I, when it, my relationship to sugar has been terrible. Essentially, when I'm stressed out, I tend to binge on sugar. For example, one of the things I used to do was buy a box of Favorable Rocher chocolates, which are like my favorite guilty pleasure. And it's fine, you know, if you have like one or two, but if I have a box sitting in my home, I will have the entire box to myself in one sitting in under 20 minutes. It's not just Ferrero Rocher, it's any type of sweet. I remember, I just remembered something that back in the day, um, many years ago, I would come home from work, I would buy this massive bag of Skittles and that would be my dinner. I would like eat that and I wouldn't be hungry for anything else because that would just fill me up and I would... It came to the point where I would hide that from my husband because we lived together and I didn't want him to see that I was, you know, binging on all this sugar and being disgusting and so yeah, I would hide the wrappers, I would like, you know, cover it up in the trash and it's, it's not okay. You know, I tried to get off of sugar by like eating less but I never, it never works. Like I can't just have a little bit of sugar, you know, like a little bit of sugar here and there, like it doesn't work for me. I was like, okay, I need to do some sort of lifestyle change to get better. And that's when I decided to go onto the ketogenic diet. Now, diet, you know, body shapes, forms, everything like that is very personal. It can be triggering. So I please ask you to be kind in the comments because this is, as I said, this is a very vulnerable position for me to even open up about this. But essentially for me, the ketogenic diet is a way to help me get off of sugar. I am not interested in losing weight. I'm thin enough. I'm just interested in resetting my metabolism, my palate when it comes to sugar. So I'm doing a very drastic keto diet where I'm not even having any fruit, any sugar whatsoever. I'm just eating proteins and fats. I saw health professionals before, I did blood work, I also did a DEXA scan to look at my body composition before even doing this diet to make sure everything was okay. So I've been on this diet for two weeks. I'm really enjoying it because I do like to eat heavier foods and the goal here, my health goal overall is A, to get off of sugar but also um, to build muscle. So I'm looking to gain weight, not lose weight. Uh, and so I eat quite a lot of calories every day, like between 1,900 to 2,000 calories a day, sometimes even more if I'm really hungry and I work out. And that is for my specific body goals. This is the way that I'm going about it. I'm not saying that people should do it. I'm just sharing with you my experience and my journey so far. As I said, this has nothing to do with losing weight. It's all about getting me off of sugar. I'm hoping that further down the line I can like reintroduce some fruit and have less of a drastic diet if you will and just be a little bit more normal but right now I'm still you know very sensitive about it that's where I, I'm at and I wanted to give you that update so that you kind of can understand like why I've been away a little bit and why I needed to take some um, time off and a step away from content creation but um, I do share um, some of this stuff, as, as I said, on Instagram. I also share some recipes because if you follow me, a few of you have asked um, to share a little bit of my journey on there. So if you're interested, um, yeah, have a look over on my Instagram. And this is it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed more of this vlog style. Let me know in the comments if you want to see more of these. And I will see you in the next video. Bye!